How many does it say? That's impossible. No, what? Let me see that. Oh, we're live. We're live. We went live. Okay, great. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry. I missed the notification on that one. Um, so my name is Nikki. I'm a senior technical evangelist. I have the absolute pleasure and honor of being joined today by Julian Simon, a machine learning expert and uh, our principal evangelist for machine learning. So he's actually going to do something really cool today uh, that we haven't had the opportunity to do yet. He's going to go through what is SageMaker, you know, why we made it, and everything that's launched from the day that it launched, which was 2017. Um, so if you feel like you've missed out at all at, or at any point in time or you're, you're just joining the SageMaker train and you want to know all of its full capability, uh, this is the session for you to tune into. Absolutely, yeah. We're going we're gonna to cover pretty much all the new features that, uh, that uh, were added to SageMaker since, uh, uh, yeah, reInvent 2017. So it's over a year and a half ago. So we have a long list. So let's get started. So who <laughs> should watch? Can anybody watch? Anybody follow along or... Are you looking for a certain kind of developer? Well, well I guess you know everybody can can uh, follow along. Uh, we're we're going to try and keep things uh, reasonably simple um, because everybody. that's really why uh, we build Amazon SageMaker to make machine learning accessible and simple for uh, for everybody from you know, new machine learning uh, uh, practitioners all the way to experts. So yeah, stick around. Please ask all your questions. Uh, Nikki is keeping an eye on questions. Yep. Uh, she, she will, uh, she will uh, send them to me later. Um, so yeah, stick around. And, uh, and if you're already using SageMaker, then uh, it's an opportunity to catch up on the new stuff. If you've never used SageMaker, if you don't know what SageMaker is, we're going to explain what it is and, uh, and what are the, the different modules in there. And hopefully, uh, you know, you'll, you'll want to try it. And I'm going to show you some, some examples. I won't really run any demos today, but uh, I'll show you some sample notebooks maybe and, and basically how to get started. <laughs> Sounds great. So everybody can watch. Seriously, Absolutely. if you're not familiar with, with machine learning or SageMaker, like, feel free to tune in and keep asking your questions. I will be watching that chat live, and I will stop him at every single point yeah. that you guys ask something that is important. Um, so yeah, we definitely encourage audience participation. So without further ado, what is SageMaker? What are we talking about? So, so SageMaker is, um, is a fully managed uh, service for machine learning. And, um, and that says it all really, but I, I got to dive a little deeper. So let's, let's maybe rewind to uh, how we used to do machine learning um, a few years ago. So a few years ago, um, you would build a data set, you would start from whatever data was, was meaningful to, to solve your problem. And that was an, a, a already, sometimes was a daunting task, right? right. Building Find, the data or set. finding the data. Yeah, because there's a big difference between having data and having a data set, right? Yes. So data is in your backends, you know, MySQL and Postgres or whatever you use, or maybe uh, web logs, you know, Apache logs somewhere. So that's data. And it's, it's in raw form, it's unclean, it's incomplete, you know, it's messy in all kinds of ways. And, and, and then you need to build that into a data set that's good enough to train on. So we would do that, and it was already quite an involved process. And then we would write, you know, bespoke code uh, using libraries or maybe even custom code to train on. And we would try this on, uh, on dev infrastructure, so whatever was on the desktop or whatever we had in the closet, right? <laughs> Most of the time, that was in the closet. You have uh, a server just chilling in your closet yeah, somewhere? Yeah, just warming the office in winter and warming the office in summer as well. Got it. Um, so that got interesting. Uh, and then we would try to get some kind of early model, and, and we would try then to put that on prod infrastructure, train at scale, and basically, you would have to manage all the infrastructure yourself, and and all the way to deployment, uh, which uh, you know we'll talk about a lot of de about deployment today because I believe it's actually the hardest part. Um, and we would have to manage everything really. So it was heavy lifting from beginning to end, spending a significant portion of your time on non-machine learning tasks. And, and even someone, the machine learning tasks were not that easy. And if someone like me, who's just a regular software developer, wanted to get started with machine learning. How difficult would that would it have been in those days? Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah, maybe f five, seven years ago, um, the, the answer would be pretty difficult. I had no right? chance, guys. 
Yeah, because uh, so you would need to do all that work, and and you would need a, a solid background in in you know computer science and machine learning and stats and math. Because again, chances chances where you would write your own algos or you would tweak pretty deeply what those algos uh, did. And so, uh, and so the typical setup back then was you would have uh, like a machine learning team or a data science team or whatever the, the name was for those guys at the time, and they would build the models uh, in their sandbox and then they would literally throw them over the fence to uh, product teams or, or you know, in engineering teams who would treat those as kind of, kind of a, as, as a black box try to integrate them into apps and deploy them, etc. And I, I was that guy, and I, and I was that, that was my team back in the day, and, and I, I got a lot of stuff thrown over the fence, uh, that, and then I would put it in production on uh, quite a bunch of web servers, and everything would be on fire, uh, <laughs> because, uh, and, uh, and then we would have to debug it. And uh, it was a painful, it was a painful conversation, a painful because the, the, there was a gap on you know, vocabulary and skills and everything, really, culture between the data science guys and the engineering guys. And that's what SageMaker is about, closing that gap, uh, allowing um, uh, software developers who have very little data and ML background, yeah, you and, and the other 20 million people. Uh, so we want to help all of you out there do machine learning, simplifying the machine learning part, giving you built-in algos, we'll talk about that. Um, and, and let, freeing you completely of infrastructure constraints. So zero infrastructure work, and I'll, I'll stand by that. Okay, I'll show you the, the actual code, uh, a couple of examples later on. Zero infrastructure work, whatever the scale is. So that's SageMaker, focus on machine learning, 100% of your time working on the data, working on the algo, getting the best accuracy, no infrastructure work, and, um, and in most cases, um, not a lot of machine learning expertise needed. So again, uh, all, all the all the newbies out there. You and said I, all the right things. Stay I'm there, listening. right? You're gonna learn. So, uh, how many new features have been released for this service since it launched in 2017? Um, so it's it's a lot. I mean, you know we uh, you know how we build s yeah, services, right? Really we listen fast. to customers. We start from from what customers need. We build the first version of uh, of the service. We have this uh, you know, MVP, a minimum viable product uh, mentality. So we put it out there quickly get some feedback and then iterate, 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 and never stop, right? And, and some services like S3 or EC2, they've been iterating for more than 10 years. So the wheel never stops, right? Um, and we're doing the same for SageMaker. So, uh, so globally, uh, last year in 2018, we released uh, over 200 new machine learning features. Wow. So it's almost one every day, right? If you, um, if you exclude weekends, because yeah. Yeah, we got to rest sometimes. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, occasionally. <laughs> so uh, that's a whole lot of features, and quite a few of those are actually SageMaker features. So yeah, it's it's uh, as you will see, it's across the spectrum, and it's it's a lot of new stuff, and we're not done, far from it. So are we ready to dive into these? So launches? let's go. Yeah, let's, let's have a it. have a have a cup of coffee or or twelve. <laughs> no, we're diving in. <laughs> we're gonna be here for a while. <laughs> okay, so the first set of launches is around security. Of course. Right? So what did we launch around security? Yeah, so, and the, it, it could be a surprise, right? It's like, why are those guys talking about security? They said they talk about machine learning, but guess what? Machine learning starts with data, right? And of course, all of you are there and, you know, and all of us, right? Everyone would ask that, that first question is like, hey, wait a minute, you want me to put my data on the AWS cloud and it could be very sensitive data if you're building, let's say, healthcare applications, you know, it's gonna be healthcare data, so that's pretty sensitive. Uh, if you wanna do yeah. fraud detection, well, that's like customer transactions, it's very, very, uh, again, sensitive data, so it's gotta be safe, right? Yeah, So uh, we, we, we say it all the time, and it also applies to machine learning. Um, security is job zero. I mean, it's you. We, we're not getting anything done until we have security figured out, okay? Yep. And so, um, so SageMaker is about training and deploying models. Okay, so it's it's still based on on on, uh, on EC2 instances. So they're fully managed, of course. But features related to security, to um, network security and encryption, etc., will be there. So, for example, we released um, we we integrated SageMaker with uh, the VPC, uh, so virtual private cloud, which is your own little uh, piece of the uh, AWS cloud. 
uh, with the network traffic uh, completely private uh, inside that uh, that VPC. So you can launch your uh, your SageMaker instances inside your own VPC. Uh, you nice. can apply uh, uh, you can apply VPC policies. So if you deploy your uh, SageMaker endpoints, so if you deploy your models to APIs hosted in your VPC, you can actually control who accesses the endpoint using IAM, uh, you know, Amazon IAM uh, uh, policies, applying access all control. kinds of restrictions. So access control based on you know, I don't know uh, IP addresses and and uh, and time of day and 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 whatnot. So anything that uh, IAM allows you, you can also apply on on SageMaker. So this is really important because a lot of customers want to uh, they want to train and deploy inside their own uh, inside their own VPC. They want their infrastructure to be completely private. We got a funny question. Of course, let's have the questions. Uh, Richard H. Boyd says, can SageMaker, SageMaker predict how bad pineapple pizza will taste? Um, <laughs> I'm losing my voice. Yeah, absolutely, so yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, Richard would, uh, would have to build uh, a pizza data set. So I would, I would recommend uh, trying pizza places across the US, I guess. Right, and, knows, and and probably pizza. around Europe because I, I can see there's a joke in there, because uh, it feels like Europeans have, have a stronger taste for pineapple pizza than Americans. <laughs> Is that what you mean, Richard? Uh, so you go and try out a, a whole I bunch of. I love pineapple pizza. What is the problem with that? I don't no, it's, it's it's horribly wrong. Sorry. Oh, uh, God. Jesus. <laughs> we'll do a pizza session later on. Um, so go and try out all kinds of pizza places. Build a data set out from out from that. So you could have, you know, maybe. Uh, um, features in the day set would be, you know, um, um, you know, time of day and uh, and what date you had that pizza and the location. So and maybe, what you maybe the zip code, uh, and how 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 much pineapple was actually on the pizza because I suspect that's a, that's an important feature. You know, yeah, so how many definitely. ounces or grams, depending on where you live, uh, are of pineapple you have on that pizza, and a few more features like that. And did you what did you drink with that pizza? Because if you have a, a coke with the pizza, it's probably Different than if you have a different flavors glass, coming yeah, in. Yeah, a glass of red wine. So what did you drink? Blah blah blah, and and then maybe rate your experience from, you know, one to five, or one to ten, and you would go and have a few thousand pineapple pizzas, you have and that would be enough set. to build a, a classification or a regression model actually, that would predict from uh, from a new sample, um, you know, the one to five uh, grade. So yeah, absolutely. How good that pizza will be. Yeah. So that's typical, and it's a very it's a it's a very cool question because it it, it goes to show if you have a clear business question, right, uh, that you want answered, and you you should start from there, express the problem in a single sentence that people want to uh, uh, figure out, and then find what data is necessary to answer that, and then build a data set, and then go and train, and then go and predict. Right, and of course, if you had a billion samples for that, that's a whole lot of data. That's a whole lot of servers. That's a whole lot of work. And so what if you're you want to do this manually, definitely have a pizza it. streaming session where we actually try like ten different kinds yep. of pizza, and then we create our own little tiny yeah, data okay. set. Yeah, I'll be back for that. All right. Yeah, we're gonna do Thank that. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Good idea, guys. <laughs> okay, so continuing on with security. Yes. Um, what else is a part of SageMaker? Or what else did we launch? To so. Um, so network and access control is important. Encryption is, is paramount. Uh, you know, you, 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 we keep hearing Werner uh, saying, you know, encrypt everything, encrypt everything. Yeah, and, sure, it's all say encrypt everything. Exactly. And, uh, you know, Steve Schmidt, our chief security officer, says the same. And he says, when you encrypt everything, you actually make your job easier and you make our job easier. Uh, because if, if anything happens, you know, should anything bad happen, there's a huge difference between uh, leaking uh, clear text data and linking encrypted data, right? So encrypt everything, encrypt everything, and uh, SageMaker is uh, is fully integrated with our uh, encryption service called uh, Amazon KMS, Key Management Service, that lets you encrypt um, the, the, your storage, basically, uh, with either with Amazon-provided keys or your own keys, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on your security yep. um, 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 requirements. And so, um, so we can encrypt uh, all data at rest, on, uh, on SageMaker, so uh, data uh, for uh, stored for training purposes or data stored for uh, uh, prediction purposes. So you can fully encrypt all your storage. We can also encrypt communications uh, between uh, between instances, and that's a, that's an important use case. If you uh, if you do what we call distributed training, so if you use multiple training instances that collaborate on a single training job, because you have a lot like of data. Like parallelized training. Exactly. Yeah, you you basically have those parallel 
instances that uh, that all work on a piece of the data set and then you know they put they the come results together. exactly so of course they need to exchange information to make sure you know they are synchronized and and, and everything and so we have uh, we have uh, encryption there as well so uh, that uh, ongoing traffic during the training process can be encrypted that's awesome and uh, and I guess last but not least um, we we can also restrict uh, uh, permissions uh, on your on your dev environment. So SageMaker has um, those things called notebook instances, and notebook instances are really what the name says, right? It's a fully managed instance pre-installed with uh, a dev environment, and that's for data science and machine learning. You know, Jupyter, Jupyter is, the, is the number one thing. So Jupyter is pre-installed. Um, machine learning and deep learning libraries are pre-installed, so you get your scikit-learn and your TensorFlow and your Apache MXNet, and, and so on. And all the SageMaker libraries. As and well. the SageMaker libraries and the SDK and and uh, and Boto three and, and you know uh, pretty much stuff. pretty much all in one, yeah. Uh, and and you can fire up those instances and get to work. And I guess we'll see some of that when we talk about training. So we got a good question here from uh, ZH Jinx. Does SageMaker have a built-in UI, or do I need a front-end dev to build that? <laughs> Um, okay, so that's a good question. So um, just like for any other service, um, so you can use SageMaker with the AWS console. Okay, we're gonna uh, show that. Yeah, we're gonna show later. that. So I, I think it's fine if you're learning about the service, if you're experimenting, it's okay. Um, I mean, generally, you know, we we uh, we think for production you should not use the console. You know, I think yeah. because it's hard to trace what you've done. It's hard to automate, etc. So, uh, but learning and but for learning, it's fine. It's so, uh, so you can you can add. You know, I know some people who work with the console, and that, that's fine. Um, the preferred experience would be working in the notebook using the SageMaker SDK, which is a Python SDK, to get training going and deployment going, etc. And then eventually, you will deploy your model, and you have. Um, um, if you deploy to uh, to uh, 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 an HTTPS endpoint then it's just a regular API that can be integrated in your apps. Okay? And you can also do batch right, and prediction. Right, we'll security about that. on yeah. that endpoint. And yeah, so though, yeah, exactly. So coming back quickly to those notebook instances, of course, um, they're Jupyter instances, so you can, you can open a terminal and you can add some extra libraries if you want, uh, you know, pip install, whatever. Um, and they're connected to the internet because you may want to download data sets, et cetera. So for, again, in some environments, that's, that's too permissive. So you can actually restrict, you can uh, shut down internet access for notebook instances. Oh. If you're concerned that maybe somebody in the company would do something silly and, and leak some of your data to the internet, so you can cut that off. And you can also sh uh, prevent uh, root access on okay. notebook instances. So from, I would say, network access and, and access control to encryption to... Uh, user permissions. Uh, we think we have a, a, a good set of security features uh, and we actually have a very good blog post on b building a secure data science environment. And I think that's pretty much what the, the title is. So Another you, you question can look here yep. from Maju G. Can we use SageMaker for academic projects? Is it included in the free tier or in the education tier? So SageMaker is absolutely part of the free tier. Yep. Uh, just go to uh, aws.amazon.com slash free. something like 450 hours. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a few hundred hours. Uh, but it's, I would say, you can only use the smaller instances, right? Yeah. So f I would say, once again, for, uh, for education, uh, personal education and experimentation and just learning the service, it's certainly fine. Uh, I don't think you could run actual projects. Um, but uh, you know we have we have several initiatives for uh, for, for uh, uh, education and, and research organizations to um, give you that flexibility. Yeah, to, to use you know it give you credits purposes. and grants, uh, etc. So uh, so yeah, get in touch with us and and we can point you to to the right people in in AWS to get you started there. Awesome. So moving on now, we covered the security features. Yeah. Let's get to the important stuff. Data. Building data sets. So, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty new to machine okay. learning, and, and I've, I've built a few models now. But I would say the hardest thing, and the thing that takes the longest, is building the data set before sure. you actually train it. Sure. So what have we launched to actually make that easier, simpler, go faster? Yeah, so I would say a, a lot of people simply work with, uh, you know, let's say, uh, tabular data, right? So they, they, they pull some data from... A table. Whatever relational database they have, or they have CSV files or TSV files, and 
I guess they still need to do some cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. But um, these are not so bad, right? Um, you, you need to do some ETL work and you yeah. need to do some labeling. Maybe and, split the data. Exactly. Half production or half prediction and half training. Exactly. So there's somewhere, oops, there's somewhere there. Now, uh, but people have been doing this for a while and, and, and I guess that's all right. Because if you're building that fraud detection uh, uh, data set, let's say, uh, you know, right, you, your historical data tells you this transaction was fraudulent. Okay, so yeah. one, there's a one somewhere that says it's there's fraudulent, a, a zero True. somewhere that says it's not fraudulent. True so, or false. So you have that, it's called ground truth. Okay, that's sorry for the machine learning uh, mumbo jumbo. Ground truth means you're literally writing down in the, in the data set that this is the actual truth for this sample. Okay. Now, if you work with more complex data like images or um, like or, media or natural, yeah, unstructured data, okay, so uh, natural language, uh, images, videos, etc., then you need to build a data set. And let's say you want to build, um, let's say you want to build a pizza and an uh, image uh, model, okay? So, so you I have like a hundred JPEGs. Now what? Oh, more than that. You have probably okay, hundred thousand. thousand. Okay, 100, you have hundred thousand. Uh, pictures of food, data, so. yeah, yeah, all kinds of food, and you want to learn how to detect pizza. So, you start from those images, and you need to annotate this data. So, you need to uh, uh, metadata uh, label. Let's say you want to do labeling and object detection. So, you want a text label that tells you what kind of food is in in the picture and where it is, right? You, so, you want a, a, what we call a bounding box around the pizza. So, let's say you want to detect pizza and uh, and ribs. Mm -hmm. And wings and uh, and uh, hummus, right? High buzz, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, we're trying to build that hummus, not hummus demo. It's pretty hard. Um, anyway, so you would take those hundred thousand images and label them manually, saying, "Okay, this image as a pizza, this image as wings, this image as whatever," and then draw a rectangle, literally and drawing there, rectangles. And so, there's like different ways to label, right? Like sometimes it could be like putting in different folders that are labeled different things. And you need to organize the data set, and you need to do all kinds of things. Okay, so let me ask you a question now. How how much, given one of those pictures, how much time would it take you to annotate it? Like decide which category that food is and drawing the box. And maybe you have different types I mean, of food. Maybe there's a pizza and wings. It's right? going to take me a hot second. Yeah, it would take you, you know, yeah, a few seconds, like 10, 20, 30 seconds. Okay, multiply that by 100,000. Now that takes forever. Mul yeah, multiply it by a million, multiply it by 10 million. Okay, impossible. So we build this service called SageMaker Ground Truth. Okay. Um, it's actually a module uh, inside of SageMaker, and um, and it gives you uh, uh, graphical tools to annotate uh, text data, image data, uh, on a, on different uh, use cases. Um, so you can do it yourself. Uh, you build your uh, you upload your data, your raw data to S3, and then you build your workforce. And the workforce could be you know you and me annotating stuff. Uh, or, or, or a team of evangelists annotating stuff. So a private workforce, people or, you know inside your company, or it could be um, a third party uh, uh, company approved by Amazon. So a vendor that knows how to annotate your kind of data, or it could be Amazon Mechanical Turk. Right? I, he was getting to it, I yeah. was waiting for it. Scaling up to 500,000 uh, uh, workers. So if you need to annotate millions of uh, of images, that's how you do it. Plus, while humans are annotating, uh, we try, if you want to, we can enable this feature called active learning, and that's going to train a machine learning model that looks at human annotations and tries to learn how to annotate itself. So it can do it in the future. Exactly. So let's say human accuracy is right there, okay? And then yeah. initially, the model doesn't do a good job. It's, it's learning, it's learning, it's learning. And at some point, it becomes just as good and maybe better than humans at annotating because it learned from those guys. Oh, man. And then it starts annotating like crazy. And so all that, those people are out of a job. And all those people say, okay, we can move on with our life. <laughs> and, and you save time and you can save up to maybe 70% of the manual work. So it just goes faster, it's cheaper as well. And that's how you annotate millions or hundreds of millions of, of data points. Uh, and that's what you need to do for you know things like autonomous driving or you know healthcare applications where there's just tons of images or or text that needs to be annotated. So that's how you scale it. Ground truth, awesome service. I mean, you have to try it. Really, really cool. And it's that's kind of funny because you you know you you actually have to try it and annotate uh, whatever you like to annotate, and it's pretty funny. I mean, I really enjoy it. It makes for good demos as well. So 
please try it. Definitely check that one out. It'll make you go faster with building your data sets. Absolutely. Okay. So we, we, uh, we're continuing on down to the, down the SageMaker sure. set of launches. Um, what did we launch for, for notebooks? And talk a little bit about, you know, how you can launch yep. a Jupyter notebook on an instance in SageMaker. Um, tell us a little bit more about that feature sure. and what we, what we launched to help. So the, the, the notebook instance um, is just a very convenient way to have your dev environment or your experimentation environment ready in minutes. Okay, because of course you can, yes. uh, you know, we could we could take your laptop and we could install Jupyter and we could install TensorFlow and MXNet and Scikit-Learn, and and if it had a GPU, then uh, you know we would go and install uh, uh, GPU drivers and that's kind of an experience every time you try and do that. Uh, I actually recommend that you try it for yourself, see you know, how enjoyable it is, especially when you need to do it every now and then. So again, we want to help people get started quickly with ML, and we want them to focus 100% of their time on ML. So just click in the console or call an API, start a notebook instance in, in just a couple of minutes, open it, and you, you jump straight into Jupyter, okay? So that's the notebook instance. Maybe I can, uh, I can just show yeah. what, I, what I mean by that. Why don't we that. just show you guys yeah. really fast, see what it looks like. <clears throat> okay, so here's the, here's the SageMaker console I was talking about. So we see the ground truth module here and notebook instances are here so creating one i'm not going to do it live i just want to show you quickly is as difficult as entering a name choosing so an tough. instance size and pretty much clicking on that yellow orange button here okay that's about it and a few minutes later you have an instance and you open it and it will uh it will jump straight to jupiter yep okay and so you could start you know, just, okay, I want to create a notebook for, let's say, TensorFlow Python 3. And you can see all those different environments are wow. already set up. It's based on Conda. Conda is the, a package manager for Python. And, um, and so you can easily jump from one environment to the next. All, all, everything pre-installed. No chance to mess things up like I do on my laptop. It's like, oh, I want to try the new TensorFlow version. Oh, wait, I need to uninstall the previous one. Oh, wait, I'm, okay, it needs a different... NumPy version than MXNet. Three so, hours later. Three hours later, I'm 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 on Stack Overflow trying to figure out what I've done wrong. Um, <laughs> yep, happens to the to the best of us, I guess, <laughs> all of us actually. Um, and so that's that's a problem. Okay, so I can quickly start one of those, or I can, if I'm completely new to this, uh, I can. Can you also just really quickly show us what a, what a model looks like in like if you were to open up an actual. Uh, sure. So let, let's. So that's. Um, you have a, full, a a nice collection of notebooks here, um, and these are also uh, there. These are pre-installed on the notebook instances. So these are all examples. Exactly. And, great starting and, points and they're also available on GitHub. Model. So if you look for this repo on GitHub, that's the exact same thing, right? Cool. So, really quickly, uh, let's say. Okay. Let's say I'm new to this. Well, you can you can pull the image classification and one and do some pizza. Uh, let's look at, okay, let's have a, oh yeah, we could do image classification, why not? Um, we were talking about this pizza example, right? So let's find, so these are, uh, yeah, these are the image classification example. You can see there's quite a few. Um, and we can just, let's say, okay, let's quickly look at that one. Yeah. Okay. So just use that example. Okay. And here's a notebook. And it's fair to say, uh, you know, the, the, the people who wrote this did a really good job because there's, it's not just code. I mean, there's a lot of explanations. And that's really why I nice keep pointing really people to this because, of course, you should take a look at the SageMaker documentation, which is pretty good as well. Uh, but you will really understand how the service works uh, and you will really learn what machine learning is and what you can build with it by running those examples. And those uh, all of those notebooks have a lot of explanations. I mean, they're really, really um, meant for people who don't have a lot of experience, right? If you're an expert, you'll fly through that stuff. You will learn the SDK in a couple of yeah. hours. If you're new, you know, you need to understand, okay, what's a training set? What's a validation set? What's what a are the hyperparameters? Exactly. So, um, and, and I really recommend this. So um, it's really, really helpful. So that's a notebook instance. So sure, you could absolutely, uh, you could absolutely um, install everything on your local laptop or your local dev server, <laughs> but I find this is really, this is really convenient. Plus, if you have to manage environments for a larger team, right? Let's say you're a DevOps engineer, 
and you need to provide environments for 100 data scientists, um, th that's a very convenient way as well. Yeah, right? totally. <coughs> okay. So we got a question about, uh, is this like Google Colab? Um, so it's it's based on Jupiter. Um, so you know it's uh, it's quite um, um, of course it's quite uh, comparable. Um, I would say the the, the stage maker. Uh, so from a Jupiter perspective, yes. I mean you can you can take your uh, your Python code and you can move it across uh, across different Jupiter environments. You know it's it's vanilla Jupiter. We haven't totally. tweaked anything here. So it's uh, it's it's really it's really standard. Um, I think the benefit of notebook instances is that, uh, like I said, you can launch them uh, in your own VPC. Uh, you can secure them. So it's uh, for basic experimentation. You know, sure. You know, when I'm playing around with demos, I, I'm not paying attention to security because I'm not using any kind of data that could be sensitive. Uh, and uh, and the same goes for other environments. But when you start working with real uh, real life problems, real life data, uh, real life scale. Um, y you know, you need to uh, you need to work in an environment that will let you secure and scale all the way to to the moon. And I, I think SageMaker does that pretty well. Totally, I would agree. Yeah. So besides just like the initial, I want to get a, no a Jupyter notebook running. What else? Uh, what other features do we launch around notebook instances? So. Um, so we added, let me... Let I me, think uh, there was one, like, Git integration. Yeah, so let me go back to the console. So uh, there's Git integration uh, where uh, we can actually uh, we can actually add uh, repositories. Uh, so uh, you can reference repos in your... Um, in, so you can clone a repo yeah, to create you can, your Yeah, you can add repos, your own standard, you know, uh, or, or internal repos and... and, and and make sure they're easily accessible. And, and uh, you can, when you clone, uh, well, sorry, when you create a notebook instance, uh, you can pick from uh, you can pick from those repos as well. So you know, if, again, if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to provide even faster and easier access to your own repos, then uh, then you can do that. Okay. So Git integration works with uh, you know uh, code uh, code commit, which is our uh, our service for uh, for uh, Git uh, Git repositories, or it works for uh, for GitHub or GitLab, and, you know, public services like that. Got it. And what about that uh, lifecycle configuration? Uh, yeah, so this is this is pretty cool because uh, uh, there was um, there was a lot of feedback. So people generally like the notebook instance because it's such a huge time saver. But of course, everybody likes to uh, set up their environment in, in their own specific ways. It's like, yeah. oh, I need this specific Python library, or I I have uh, actually a company code that I want to use. So. When I'm working with a notebook, you know, I don't want to have to go and pip install stuff in my notebooks. So. Like ten different things. Yeah, just to get people my will forget, set up. and you know, and, and it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's not so convenient. So lifecycle configurations are pretty similar to uh, user data on EC2, if you're familiar with that. So uh, user data on EC2 is a small script that you can pass to EC2 instances, and that they run when they're uh, uh, started uh, up, started or uh, resumed. And uh, and you can do the same for uh, 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 no started only I think started, started. or create uh, for notebook instances you can you can do it for creation and and resume so you could say well every time I'm starting my notebook instance I want to uh, install those uh, Python libraries and maybe every time I resume my instance because you can stop and and resume uh, notebook instances. Every time I resume, maybe I want to refresh my repo, so I want to git pull, whatever. Got it. Uh, again, automation, saving you time, keeping things simple, and uh, and That's letting really cool. you focus on working on the data and not not setting up environments. Super super cool feature. I really yep. really like that one. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. It's also like when you are when you're building a model in Jupyter Notebook, um, a lot of the stuff that you're doing, like if you run the different cells that information will get cached on that instance and it'll be there. And sure. if you stop the instance, it goes away. Yep. Um, and so those are helpful scripts to like maybe help you put some of the pieces yeah, if back. You, yeah, sure. If you just want to make sure you always have the, uh, the, cl the, the freshest uh, and uh, most up-to-date environment, you can, you can just, uh, or clean stuff, you know. Every time I resume my instance, I want to maybe stop my notebooks and uh, clean stuff generally and you know, make it look nice. You, you can do that. Looks like we got a question from sure. Yusuf AWS. Can I create a notebook AMI? I could harden it and circulate it amongst data scientists. Okay, so um, 
so the, um, these are managed instances uh, running um, running AMIs, obviously. Uh, we maintain the, uh, that AMI. Um, so you cannot customize the AMI used on the notebook instances. If you have that kind of requirement, then I would recommend using the deep learning AMI, which, uh, which is accessible on the AWS Marketplace. And there's an Ubuntu version, there's an Amazon Linux version, and they also come with you know, Conda environments, so you know, pretty much the same thing. Um, and this is a, a proper AMI that you can either use um, as is, or, uh, or of course you can fire up and customize and save as your own AMI and distribute. So uh, if, you, if you have that kind of requirement, I would recommend starting from the deep running AMI and customizing it. But yeah. when it comes to SageMaker, you know, we do that work for you. Totally. Um, so moving on. Yes. So now I'm, I'm, I'm in my notebook and uh, I need to use an algorithm to train my model. Uh, what are we what are we offering around you know our built-in algorithms or other algorithms or libraries that I could be using? How did we help support developers there? Okay, so uh, early on, you know, I said uh, um, you know stick around if you're new to this because we have built-in algos. Okay? Yeah, and that's what I mean. So we realize um, again, you know, we need uh, a lot of organi organization need to um, use machine learning, but they don't have a lot of of skills and and they don't want to or they cannot hire those uh, 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 unicorn data scientists, it's difficult, you know, and, and so on. So how about we build, you know, built-in algos that are easy to use, that solve the, the, the typical and not so typical machine learning problems out there. And, uh, and of course, AWS uh, being AWS, these needs to scale, okay? Totally. Uh, because of course, a lot of people at first will small uh, will solve smaller problems. But as you move on, uh, you will start solving bigger and bigger problems. And scaling machine learning is uh, is not that easy. And it's one of those roadblocks you hit if you use other, uh, you know, I would say the legacy ML uh, way of doing things. It's like you scale up and up and up and up and up and. Uh, until you know you cannot and writing distributed algos is not for everybody right it's right. it's very very hard i mean generally distributed programming is difficult distributed ml is is crazy it's difficult. talking about so writing an we've algorithm done that you, you can parallelize the training yeah. on so we've done this for you so today we have 17 built-in algos uh, i think we started with nine when we launched what are we, the seven um so the, the 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 initial ones are where the uh, I would say the, the classical ones like linear regression. K nearest neighbor. Uh, I think uh, K N N. Uh, yeah, K N N was there. Um, uh, P C A was there. Uh, I think um, image classification. Uh, image classification was there, etc. etc. Et so classical problems, and um, but again, we made sure you could scale those things. So if you need to train linear regression on a petabyte of data, so not everybody's problem, I agree, but hey, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> and so someone will say, come on, I've got 10 petabytes, right? I'm waiting for that question. Um, if you need to train on a lot of data, then you, you need to be able to do distributed training, uh, so training at scale uh, with multiple instances. And, uh, and of course, you need to be able to stream the data to uh, the training instance, because you're not going to copy even a terabyte of data, right? You're not going to copy one terabyte of data on the network to the training instance, because you would need one terabyte of storage, mm -hmm. and, and no one wants to pay for that. Uh, and it takes a while to copy one terabyte anyway. So we have, we have this feature called pipe mode, which lets you stream the training data directly from S3 all the way to that training instances. That is so instances. cool. So in, that's and so that's cool. why we say you can train on infinitely large data sets, because as you stream, as you now are streaming, you, you, have no, uh, you don't have a requirement to have a crazy amount of RAM or a crazy amount of storage. Um, you could be training on you know, medium-sized instances, and that's okay, because they will get the data batch by batch, uh, or chunk by chunk, and they will train on that and get the next chunk. Pipe mode is available for several of, of those algos, and, uh, and it's pretty cool. And like I said, uh, we added new algos as well. How do you find out which one pipe mode is available for? Does it say uh, so yeah, so the documentation will uh, the documentation will uh, will tell you that. So if you look at the SageMaker documentation, which is online, just like uh, all uh, all AWS doc, um, there's a specific section for built-in algos and a subsection for each algorithm. 
that tells you, you know, what's, what uh, input format the algo expects uh, for training and prediction, um, what's the recommended instance type for it, and also, you know, does it support distributed training, does it support Python? Okay, so the doc really cool. will tell you that, yeah. And so we added algos, of course, because some customers said, yeah, that's pretty cool, but we have other problems, right? And so now we're starting to get into the more exotic stuff, and I think this is part of the uh, unique uh, appeal of SageMaker. Um, you have algos like DeepAR. So DeepAR is actually an Amazon-invented algo. Whoa. It was published, so Amazon Research. Woohoo! Well done, guys. And what is this algorithm for? A DeepAR is for time series. Okay, so okay. Uh, predicting, forecasting, basically, right? So a lot of companies, a lot of organizations have time series data, um, and it's all around us. And predicting that with the right level of accuracy is not easy, especially at large scale. So DPR will actually be able to take many time series in parallel. So imagine you're trying to forecast uh, a demand for a thousand different products. Okay, you can actually build a single model based on those thousand time series. So if you have common patterns between the time series, like if you're selling, you know, uh, uh, skiing equipment. There's probably some kind of relation between you know, uh, skis and ski shoes and, you know. And also like time of year. Exactly, time of year, etc. So DPR will do that. So uh, it's, uh, it's a great algo. It's, it's part of SageMaker. Another one is called Blazing Text. And again, I like it's, the name of this yeah, it's, it's got a cool name, uh, Blazing Text. Because uh, it, so it's, a, it's a natural language processing algo. Uh, it it, it uh, improves on uh, an algo called Fast Text. Um, which was designed by Facebook, which is a really cool algo Super again. Super cool. So Blazing is faster than fast. So we enhanced right? it. And so we enhanced it. Uh, so you can now train NLP models on GPUs, and fast text could, could only do the same on, on CPU. And these stay compatible. So fast text, if you, do, if you work on NLP applications, of course you know fast text. And, um, and it's, it's fully compatible. Right? Uh, so, and we, we keep adding more, like uh, anomaly detection algos, and, um, and deep learning algos for object detection and semantic segmentation, etc. So The names of these are just like excellent. Yeah, the name are, yeah. They're like they like sound Random Cut Forest. Random Cut Forest, yeah. I could, I could talk about what that one. What is that one? one? <laughs> you don't want to know. Okay, but, yeah. I don't want to know, apparently. <laughs> Where, who, who gets to decide the names of the algorithm? Uh, whoever invents them, right? Whoever invents them. Guys, but I think half the fun in doing algo research is uh, getting to pick the name. Got it. Right? I really so want to meet those people are all random about cut forest. I wanna, yeah, random cut forest. Yes. Exactly. So it's an anomaly detection algo. And again, this is a pretty hard problem. And uh, you know, we think we make it much simpler by uh, providing you those... Uh, Really cool. So the way you work with those is they're off the shelf. So you literally you're in the with the SageMaker SDK. You select your algo, um, and it's all based on containers, by the way. So that really means giving the name of that container, and and you set some parameters and a few lines of code to set up training, and you're done. Right. So I'll wow. show you uh, uh, when we talk about training. I'll show you uh, how, how to do this. But no, you don't need to write a line of machine learning code to do this. This so if you're true. new to ML, again, look at those uh, sample notebooks I pointed you at uh, and, and start running those examples. And yeah, I did will, this on Twitch you will get two weeks it. ago. Yeah, yeah, you'll get it in no time. So you, you said you launched with uh, nine initial algorithms and then we launched eight more after exactly. for use cases. Yeah. So we have 17 yeah. algorithms. And they right cover, now. you know, nice uh, section of the problems you, you would be facing when working on ML and, uh, and deep learning as well. Yeah. Super awesome. Okay, so let's move on to frameworks. Everybody right. wants to know about sure. the frameworks. TensorFlow, MXNet, maybe you've heard these framework names before, but you don't know what they are. Um, so how are we supporting built-in frameworks? So th this is important because, of course, built-in algos will, you know, will help you solve quite a few problems. But what about customers who've, who are already doing machine learning, right? And right. I'm sure a lot of you out there, you're, you're already running TensorFlow code, Keras code, uh, um, MXNet code, PyTorch code, and so on and so totally. on. So, um, so what we what we built is we have that list of uh, built-in frameworks. Okay, so built-in containers for those environments, uh, and you just bring your code. Okay, and uh, and we have this cool feature called script mode that really really makes it easy to take existing, let's say, TensorFlow code 
and run it on SageMaker, just integrating it on SageMaker with just a few lines of code. And I just, and I mean, just a few, I mean, I'm talking like three, four lines of code to, to, to basically, uh, you know, plug your code inside the SageMaker environment, receiving, you know, location of a training set and validation set and passing hyperparameters. So script mode is, uh, you know, it will get you running in no time. So again, bring your own code, run it on, on SageMaker. Uh, distributed training is available out of the box. So no need to set up uh, distributed training. Again, that's one of the hardest things. frameworks? TensorFlow? Okay, so TensorFlow, Apache MXNet. Okay. Uh, Keras. Uh, is, is supported in both of these. As you probably know, Keras is a high-level API that supports uh, multiple backends, so like TensorFlow and MXNet. So you can run Keras in either the TensorFlow uh, container or the MXNet container. And Keras is, is a, if you don't know where to start with deep learning, I think Keras is, is, a, is a good way to start. It's, uh, it's very easy and very well documented. Uh, PyTorch, PyTorch. Is, available, is available. Uh, Chainer is available. Wow. Um, Scikit-Learn is uh, is a recent addition. We added it uh, last year in advance. So Scikit-Learn really is too. yeah, it's a popular one for ML. Um, and 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 we have a few more, but these are these are really the re really the main ones, right? The one that everyone in, everyone wants. And so you could say, well, yeah, sure, okay, nice, but uh, I can just grab a TensorFlow container or an MXNet container from the Docker Hub, and, and, and what's the big difference? So, again, the big difference is this stuff is integrated with SageMaker. So distributed training and every all kinds of cool features we're going to talk about are fully integrated. Um, infrastructure is transparent because you just uh, train with a couple of lines of code. Deployment. And, yeah, deployment is integrated, and these are not the vanilla versions. Okay, so now we're getting to the really good stuff. Oh. So we have, a, we have specific teams uh, and they're probably pizza teams, right? You know, we're, we're big on pizza but teams. But they don't eat pineapple pizza. <laughs> but no, I don't guess, no, they no, they don't, no. Just had to ask. Yeah, they're too reasonable to do that. Yeah, me. probably. Um, and so we have specific teams who focus on optimizing those frameworks. So for example, we have a team working exclusively on TensorFlow and, and making sure TensorFlow runs as fast as possible That's really on AWS cool. infrastructure. I didn't know that. So we have, we've done some benchmarks last year showing that uh, we could train 11 times faster. Yeah, I said 11, okay? He specifically 11, said 11. <laughs> 11 times Remember faster. Remember that number. On CPU instances compared to the, to the stock version. Um, and we also scaled TensorFlow linearly all the way to 256 GPUs because we found the vanilla version uh, would not scale linearly. So if you double the number of GPUs on a training job, you would not get twice the speed up. And so that means basically you're wasting money and yeah. your training times are longer. So we tweak that. And now you can scale linearly up to 256. Okay. Uh, so that's the kind of work we do. We, we It's not just packaging. It's, it's you know... Uh, in some cases, tearing those things apart, you know, diving very, very deep on how they work and, and optimizing the, the core technology in there to make sure we make the most of our CPU instances, GPU instances, to give customers the, the basically the most bang for the buck, right? All right, so let's get to the good part. Yeah. Tell me about training. Okay. This is the fun part. This sure. is the really, really fun part of, uh, of building a model, yeah. you know, training, and then you get to inference. Uh, this is the exciting part sure. for me, at least. So what... What are our features around training? So training, uh, and if we could please switch to my screen for a second, because I said, you know, it's zero infrastructure work, and I want to make this very clear. Uh, he really wants to stand by his word. Absolutely. So Just this is how you do it. it, okay? So, all right, that part. So here we selected, we selected the... Uh, the, the built-in algo for image classification, so that's going to be the first parameter here, and that that estimator object is how you configure training jobs. An IAM role. Yeah, an IAM role and this. Okay, oops. That's it. So if you want to train your image classification algo on that GPU instance, P2XL is the is one of our GPU instances. It's going to spin it that's up it. and then shut it down once it's done. Just say, training. I need one. If you need 10... Just say 10. Wow. If you need 50, just say 50. Okay? But then it's going to spin all of them up. And when you and run that cell, down. actually when we run the next cell, which is uh, yeah, fit, this one here, that the fit API is the one that gets the, the training going, receiving yep. the location of the data, etc. Um, 
Sage Maker spins it up, pulls the image classification container in this case, injects your parameters, uh, copies the data set because here it's a, it's a tiny one, we can copy it. And, and tr the training process starts, the training log is available in CloudWatch and uh, CloudWatch logs. And then when the training is over, SageMaker shuts down everything and you just get billed for the amount of seconds that you trained on. So there's no chance Super ever cool. that you will leave stuff running for no good reason. Okay, and that's again one of the benefits of SageMaker. Not only don't you manage anything when it comes to training infrastructure, you're, you're guaranteed by design that you only pay for the seconds, minutes, or hours that you train on. And then you know, you, nothing stays on. And some of us are guilty of that, right? Leaving EC2, EMR, uh, instances. Guilty as charged. Yeah, guilty. Yeah, except you know, we don't pay our AWS bills. And all That's those right. good people out there, they do. So I want to make sure they don't spend their money um, inefficiently. So, uh, so that's that's what I mean when I mean no. Uh, 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 and I guess we can take my screen uh, away, please. And we specifically like we're talking about training. We launched specific features around reinforcement learning, yeah. for example. So the first one I want to mention, it, oh, it's it's not one. quite there yet, okay? Uh, but it was announced at the New York Summit, and a lot of you are waiting for this. Is spot instances? Oh yes. So we will soon have spot instances available for SageMaker training, okay? And you know, generally spot. Uh, give you gives you about a 70% discount on EC2, and we expect to see the same on, on SageMaker. So stay tuned, it's coming soon. Uh, if you're not familiar with EC2 yeah. Spot also, shameless plug, <laughs> I'm doing a stream about it next Wednesday, so tune in for yeah, that. Okay, so check that out. If you don't know about Spot, um, please, yeah, listen to this. You're going to save a, a crazy amount of money. Yeah, really. Um, so that's, I would say, generally the, the, the big announcement, the latest big announcement. And uh, at, at last reInvent, we also added capabilities for uh, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a, is a pretty new type of machine learning. I don't want to go into details because that would be another two-hour session right there. But basically, uh, reinforcement learning is good for problems where it's too difficult or even impossible to build a data set. Imagine you're trying to build a data set for the stock market. Okay? It's too chaotic, right? It's, yeah. Or uh, oil exploration or autonomous driving is very difficult. So instead of trying and build a data set that would not summarize the problem well, we use an exploration technique. Uh, and, uh, and by alternating cycles of exploration, learning, exploration, learning, literally interacting with the environment, which is usually in a simulator, Interacting with that environment, getting rewards. It reminds me of like a Zumba, like hitting the yeah. walls and like trying to yeah. find it. Trying to find what works, what doesn't. Uh, you gradually learn how to do more of the positive stuff and less of the negative stuff, and you learn how to do things right. And the best example of this is Depressor. Okay, so Deep, I'm sure you've seen Depressor. Yes. I'm sure, we have tons of Depressor videos. So on Twitch. we have a lot of Depressor <laughs> content coming for you guys. All right. And so. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, Depressor is based on reinforcement learning, and it you can train it on AWS, meaning really training it on SageMaker, and then deploy the model to the car. So RL is that new technique that's pretty cool, and uh, it's uh, it's fully integrated with SageMaker. Okay, so what's up next? What what other feature did we launch? Um, yeah, so for training. Another <laughs> important feature. Or I guess another challenge is when you train your models, right? When you go into that cycle of you know tweaking the data, training, looking at results, tweaking the model, training again, blah blah blah. You want to maximize accuracy, okay? And it's a if if you do this manually, honestly, you know it's going to take you forever. It's going to cost a bit of money, and it's not guaranteed that you're going to get a good result. But let's be honest, when it comes to picking hyperparameters and so on, or even model architecture, we don't really know what we're doing, right? I I I mean I I don't to say I don't I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm faking it. He totally knows what I'm doing. I'm totally faking it. So we have this feature called uh, automatic model tuning. And again, it's a good name because that's exactly what it is. It will, uh, it will automatically explore ranges of hyperparameters that you selected. Wow, that so, is, that's really cool. So yeah, and, uh, and it will train a certain number of models and using machine learning techniques, not random, although, although we do support random search as well. That's one of the new features because customers were uh, using that and they wanted to have that on SageMaker as well. But it's not going to search randomly within those hyperparameters. It's a change. range? So you, give it, so you define ranges and you say explore, let's say, the learning rate and the batch size and whatever else you want to you explore between those two values. And it's, I guess, we can't find the optimal parameters ourselves, but at least we can come up with reasonable ranges. Totally. And say, okay, SageMaker, please run 20 or 30 jobs 
and find me, be smart about it, right? The most accurate model. And find me the, the most accurate model using those using parameters in those range. And then it will tell you what they are at yeah. the end too. I mean, the, the, analog, the, analog, uh, the analogy I take is, okay, we're in this room, right? So we can yeah. define the ranges from, you know, the left wall to the right wall and the back wall to this wall. Yep. And I'm looking for my car keys, right? It's somewhere in there. SageMaker, you know, find me the spot in this space where I drop my car keys or my smartphone or my glasses. Okay, so if you were to manually explore that space, it would take you a while yeah. right, to find that specific place if you uh if you let SageMaker do it then it's going to be smart about it and it's going to quickly find that spot in the space with the optimal result so i'm still waiting for SageMaker to tell me where my glasses are right so <laughs> feature request for the You're team please <laughs> so uh yeah model tuning is uh, is this and so you can do what we call bayesian optimization which is the clever way or you can do random search, which people use as a baseline most of the time because they, they want to do this first and then they run the clever way and they want to see that it's better, and it is. Um, All right, so we only have a couple minutes yeah, left, sure. so let's get to, sure. I have my model trained, I'd like to make inference on it regularly. Sure. How do I get that in the world? Deployed so, um, so deployment is just about the same. I mean, if you, uh, I, I showed you the code for training, right, uh, where we just say, hey, please deploy on, X instances of that type. It's exactly the same for deployment. You just say, hey, please deploy on uh, one M4 Excel instance, etc., etc. So again, it's zero infrastructure work. So you can deploy in two ways. You can deploy to HTTPS endpoints, which become you know APIs that you can invoke uh, using your favorite language uh, or the SageMaker SDK if you're experimenting, or you can do uh, you can do batch. Uh, a batch prediction, okay, a batch transform, we call it. So that's useful if, let's say, you need to predict 10 gigabytes of data every month. Okay, you don't want to deploy endpoint and you don't want to push 10 gigabytes. No, you just want right? it to run through. It's it's a it's a one off. So just create this transform uh, operation and, and 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 be done with it literally. Yep. Oh, again, fully managed. And now we have this uh, brand new feature where you can actually select the features that you want to predict on. Okay, so you oh. don't have to pre-process the, the data set excluding columns. You no, know, no, I want to remove that stuff. You could actually give your uh, extract, uh, the data extracted from your Redshift or uh, RDS backend or wherever it is and say, okay, please use column 1, 9, 3, and 20. And, uh, and these go to the model. So you save on ETL as well. Right. Wow. So yeah, that, that's pretty nice. Uh, batch transform is, is very good. We have a question really sure. fast. Um, J.M. Castagneto says, is there provisioning for model versioning? So uh, that's a good question. So all the training jobs are, uh, are, are tr fully traceable. So if you look at the console, you'll see uh, historical information on all the training jobs. So what algo you used, what hyperparameters you used, what, uh, where's the, what training set you used, what uh, validation set you used. So pretty much, uh, and there's a search feature available in SageMaker. It's still uh, beta, but you, you, know, you can use it that lets you quickly find models. Okay, so I want to find that XJBoost model that I trained over a month ago and that gave me 0.95 plus accuracy. So yeah, you can, uh, you can, you can figure that out. Um, so another cool feature that we launched is, uh, in, it's called Inference Pipelines. Okay. So in a nutshell, most of the time you need more than one model, okay? Of course, when you learn about ML, one model is more than enough. Yeah. <laughs> but Pretty quickly, you realize, oh, I need a model to pre-process my data, and I need a model to predict, and I need another model to post-process. So initially, let's say you have those three models, you would have to, uh, you had to deploy three endpoints, and you had to manually orchestrate the pipeline. You know, call the one, call the first one, call the second one. Call You're the just other. creating a pipeline. So that was boring, right? That was and, boring. Yeah, sorry. And uh, so now we have the inference pipelines. So we got where, rid of it. So we got rid of it. Well, you can still do that if you love orchestration code. But I would recommend building the pipeline. So you train those three models. You chain them as a pipeline. And you deploy the pipeline as a single unit to a single endpoint. All within the same And now nature. when you push data to the endpoint, it's going to flow through the pipeline. That's and again, really you can cool. do this on endpoints. And you can do this on batch transform. So if you, have, you can do up to five models. So if you have complex workflows, you can chain them up and deploy them just like that. Um, Let's keep going, right? Yeah, what I you told what you. Else yeah, do we have? yeah. What else do we have? So, uh, I guess the 
Um, the, the, the next one I want to talk about, it's a major one. It's called Elastic Inference. And again, this was released at last reInvent. Yeah. So Elastic Inference lets you deploy uh, to f uh, fractional GPUs. Okay. So prior to that, you had to pick between a GPU instance or a CPU instance. And for some customers, it was they were stuck between a rock and a hard place because if they deployed on CPU, it was probably more cost effective, but maybe a little too slow, yep. especially if you have image models and complex models. And if they deploy to GPU instances, everything was super fast, but maybe a little bit on the expensive side, especially if the model was not large enough to fully utilize the GPU instance. Right. right? If you have crazy large models, fine. If you have like mid-sized models, they're not going to keep the GPU instance fully busy. And so That's it's kind right. of a waste. So Elastic Inference lets you take a CPU instance, any CPU instance, and it works on EC2 as well, not just SageMaker, and it can attach a, a, an accelerator, a GPU accelerator to it. Whoa. And those come in three sizes. Yeah, medium, large, Excel. And each size gives you a specific uh, acceleration level, number of teraflops. So you can find the right compromise. And if you uh, and you can get a huge discount compared to a full-fledged GPU. So instance. now people are choosing that CPU with yeah. the accelerator. Yeah, so you choose the CPU that works best for your business app, let's say, and you attach an accelerator for, just for the prediction part, and you can tune it so that you get the right level of performance and the right level of wow. pricing. So it's, it's a super, super feature. If you're deploying to GPU instances by default, please try Elastic Inference, and, uh, and you're going to save money, and you can thank me on Twitter. And I guess the last one... Make sure you thank him on Twitter. Oh, yell at me on Twitter if you didn't save money, but I, I'd be surprised, right? Uh, yelling at us is part of our job desk, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. all right. And I think the last one I want to share with you guys is uh, a, a service called Neo, okay? So uh, SageMaker Neo. Uh, so Neo is basically a model compiler and a model runtime. So the idea is you, you train a model on SageMaker. Yeah. Uh, or maybe elsewhere. It could be a pre-trained model that, uh, because, again, it's a modular service, so use what you like. Uh, so you take a model, uh, compile it with Neo for a certain architecture. You could say, I want to compile it for Intel platforms or uh, NVIDIA platforms or uh, ARM platforms. So one API call, super simple. And then you get an optimized version of the model with native code for that platform. To run on those devices. And then you take the Neo runtime, which is a really tiny runtime, much smaller than the TensorFlows and MXNets of the world. And you take that runtime, you load the model, and now you predict with native code. And there's a nice speed up, right? So it's wow. it's uh, again it's fully integrated with SageMaker. It's uh, just like Elastic Inference. Elastic Inference is just one parameter away. Neo is one API call away, and it deployment is super easy. You could also use this on EC2 if you wanted, uh, but you can now optimize machine learning for a specific hardware target, right? It's especially if you're ARM platforms, if you use IoT devices where you want to run ARM-based. Uh, IoT devices where you want to run uh, prediction, Neo is a is a nice uh, is a nice tool to have. All right, so we have one minute left. Yes. What do you want to leave them with? Should we throw some links at them? So uh, should we do a giveaway? Uh, yeah. So I guess uh, yeah. I guess we said we'd give some. You want you guys want AWS credits? <laughs> Who wants AWS credits? All right. So let's uh, let's start this giveaway. All right. While you do this, okay. Um, I think the, the best way to get started, like I said, go through the SageMaker what? documentation. Um, you know, run, oh, you give it a quick, uh, a quick run through, understand the workflow, you know, uh, training, deploying, etc. And then go to those uh, notebook uh, examples that I, uh, that I pointed you at. Okay, so it's uh, the repo, it's called Amazon SageMaker examples on, uh, on GitHub. And, uh, and start running notebooks, okay? And don't worry, all of these are... You guys are... always think it's rigged. I haven't even started it yet. I clicked the start button, but <laughs> one second. Uh, be, be nice to her, come on. Uh, so uh, uh, just start running those examples, and don't worry, they're not expensive, okay? So uh, uh, these are really designed to be running in just a few minutes. Uh, so you're not going to, you know, you're not going to spend your, your, your budget on... Uh, on those notebooks, it's uh, most of them just train for a few minutes, so it's going to be a few pennies, right? So just go through that and uh, and and work your way through the built-in algos and and the frameworks, etc., etc. So I think this is how you join.
Yeah. Uh, we also have a 10 minute tutorial. Uh, you, you can easily uh, Google that. Uh, SageMaker 10 minute tutorial if you just want the quick, uh, the quick experience of building and training and, uh, and deploying a model. Of course, we have lots of uh, reInvent videos out there. Uh, there were lots of... Uh, oh yeah, no, just giveaway guys without the exclamation part, mark works. It's putting you in the viewer list. So just type giveaway and uh, you'll enter into the giveaway. Right. And then we'll pick a winner and then we will wrap. Yep. So yeah, YouTube videos, uh, reInvent videos, uh, the machine learning, uh, the AWS machine learning blog. Um, we have a forum, an AWS forum for SageMaker, and uh, and I'm I'm trying to, to keep an eye on SageMaker questions on Stack Overflow as well. If you tag them with Amazon Dash SageMaker. All right, two seconds et cetera, left into et the giveaway, ending in two seconds, and I'm gonna click the button. We have plenty of people in this giveaway right now. All right, ready? <laughs> do you want to click? Do you no, 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 because no, no, they'll be yelling at me, and I get it's it. It's rigged. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna yes, get no, the rigged. And I, and I'm not innocent in any way. Okay, so. roll. <laughs> Richard, you win. The pizza guy. Richard H. Boyd wins. He asked the question. Um, there you go. You Richard, make sure pineapple you... Pineapple pizza wins all the time. <laughs> you uh, whis whisper me on Twitch, and I will send you AWS right. credits. All right. It is not rigged. It was not rigged. I promise. All right. We got to wrap. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you'd like to see more content from Julian, make sure you send him a tweet or me. Yep. Um, we can get him back on Twitch to yep. teach us more about machine J -U -L learning. J-U-L-Simon. On Twitter, I'll put and, his. Uh, uh, I'll put his Twitter. Yeah, in the, yeah I'm, in the I'm chat. kind of easy to find. Happy to. Uh, my messages are open, so uh, shoot me questions and uh, or again ask questions on Stack Overflow, and I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, I want to thank you very very much. You have a really cool studio. It was a pleasure to uh, to talk to it all of you. It was my pleasure to have right? you here. Uh, so I, I hope you learned a few things, and of course, you know, let's continue the the conversation online, and maybe I'll see some of you on the road as well, right? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.